Ladies and gentlemen, the session will begin shortly. Please take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, the session will now begin. Please take your seats. Today, over 258 million migrants around the world live outside their country of birth. Recent years have witnessed an important increase in mobility, with growing numbers of migrants and refugees attempting to cross the Mediterranean Sea, at the risk of abuse, exploitation and the denial of their fundamental human rights. Across the Atlantic region, Poverty still motivates hundreds of thousands to seek economic opportunities outside of their country of origin, posing significant humanitarian and security challenges. How can countries prevent, combat, and eradicate trafficking in persons in the context of migration? What would be the best way to address the root causes and drivers of unsafe and unmanaged migration? What would be a win-win solution for countries of destination and origin? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage our moderator for this session, senior anchor at Citizen TV, Jeff Koinangi. Hello. <clears throat> All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome to the seventh annual Atlantic Dialogues. Welcome to the beautiful, beautiful Maimuna here in uh, Marrakesh. It's great to be here, folks. Thank you to the Atlantic Dialogues. Thank you to the Policy Center for the New South. That number you just heard, 258 million people around the world. Just think about it for a moment. More than the population of Brazil, entire population. More than the entire population of Nigeria. There's a lot of Nigerians out there in the world, imagine that. More than that population. That's a huge number. We're gonna be talking about that. First, we're gonna start with AD Talks, 30 minutes, uninterrupted with two very dynamic gentlemen. You're gonna love this conversation. And then after that, we'll have a plenary. In the plenary is when I'll urge you to be a part of it. We like dialogue, that's why we're here for the most part. So you take part. And I'm a very interactive person, I'm always on social media, so ask a comment or question on social media, copy me. My Twitter handle is at Koinange Jeff, K-O-I-N-A-N-G-E Jeff, one word. Same thing on Instagram and Facebook. You copy me, and I'll retweet it to 2 million or so of my followers, 2.1 actually as of yesterday, but it's okay. Who's counting? Let's do that, and let's have a good conversation. So first up, ladies and gentlemen, talking about this topic, gentlemen who are not shy about what they say, what they talk about. Please welcome on stage, first up, uh, former Sec Secretary of State for the Arab League, Monsieur Amre Moussa. Uh, Secretary General, Secretary General, yeah. And of course, former Minister for Foreign Affairs of Spain, Miquel Angel Moratinos. Welcome, gentlemen. Okay. 
Yeah. Welcome, sir. Thank you. By the way, for translations, Spanish, Channel 1, okay. French, Channel 3, English, Channel 4. Welcome, sir. I'm going to move some. I know you are raring to go. Raring to go, because you just heard the talk about NATO, the little first uh, session, and uh, the topic of migration. You're sick and tired of hearing that word, aren't you? Yes, indeed. <laughs> we have been discussing this issue for four days now, from all its dimensions. I do not suggest that we repeat ourselves again. This is one of the problems, not the major problem or the only problem that we are facing in the Mediterranean or even in the world. The problems of poverty, the problems of terrorism, the problem of reform itself, those, those are issues that have to be discussed mm. in addition to others like migration and so So you think we're dwelling too much, Miguel Angel Moratinos, are we dwelling too much on the concept of migration? Well, I have no problem with migration. I've been uh, working with my dear friend, uh, Yusuf Hamrani and others, uh, uh, Minister Benaisa. But I think uh, what struck me is that you invite us, the organizer, uh, it was a bit of strength for me uh, to put together the Mediterranean Atlantic. I have to, to confess to the audience that while I was preparing my introductory remark, I was a bit confused. How am I going to, you know, I'm coming from the French school, so I try to be rational and put the ideas in certain order. And I say, well, they are asking us to talk of two seas, well, one sea and one ocean, Atlantic and the Mediterranean. Uh, and they invited two, two personalities that belong to the two key or enter of the Atlantic and the Mediterranean, not the Gibraltar Strait, Spain and Morocco, but Spain, myself, and the Canal of Suez, no, Mr. Musa. So how is the interrelation between the Atlantic and the Mediterranean? So that's geography. Uh, you know, diplomacy now, they are with uh, new technology, but we f forget the basic of diplomacy that have to be geography and history. So geography, as I told you, Atlantic, Mediterranean, uh, the, the going from Atlantic to the Canal Surf, to go to the Pacific, to the Asian, and to the United States, Latin America, and then history. Well, in the history, Mediterranean was the center of the world. We have to say that. We are lucky, the Mediterraneans, during many centuries. But uh, recent his history has produced that uh, the Mediterranean was part of the bipolar world. And I think it was Atlantic. It was the US who ruled and was capable to dominate you know, the geopolitics of the Mediterranean from the Atlantic. Since our colleague uh, of uh, Northern Africa, mm, Mediterranean countries and uh, some uh, Southern European Mediterranean countries decide to work together. We started in Alexandria in the forum, Mediterranean Forum, and then we produce in the Barcelona process for the first time a autonomous, independent initiative where I remember we invited the Americans to be observer. They were very cross, you know. The Americans were very, very negative. They said, why you are not full members? And we say, my dear friends, we are allies, we are partners, but for Mediterranean affairs, let's go discuss ourselves without being uh, involved and influenced by the U.S. That means not being informed by the Atlantic. So uh, the things have changed. Barcelona didn't produce the result, as you mentioned. And now the Atlantic is not only the North Atlantic, as we've been discussing just the season before. It's not the security military approach. Uh, what we tried in the Barcelona process was to introduce the root causes of the insecurity and stability in the world. And then comes uh, energy, trade, terrorism, migration. And so I have no problem to discuss about migration. But as Amr has said, as a one of the issues we should try to be. And then the Atlantic and Mediterranean un un converting because uh, a lot of migration people come from West Sub-Saharan, I mean from the facade of Atlantic African to the Mediterranean, to Europe, 
and to other destinations. All right, let me cut you off there. And, you know, you raise a couple of really interesting points. But Amre Musa, before you were talking about poverty being one of the reasons, insecurity, maybe even bad leadership in some instances, that causes pictures like those to be seen all over the world. Mm -hmm. Of course. I agree that it is a very important issue, and we have to discuss it. But the agenda, the world agenda, is very long, and we have to address so many issues. The issue of this uh, session, this panel, is about Atlantic and Mediterranean. This book, The, uh, the Atlantic Currents, I was reading in it yesterday a paragraph I want to read it to the audience. In 1993, Samuel Huntington's Clash of Civilization put forward a conceptualization of opposing worlds. To analyze major geopolitical zones, Chinese world, Russian world, a naive question came up, what about an Atlantic world? And I would say, what about a Mediterranean world? In fact, the Mediterranean is a world by itself, influence it by so many cultures and politics, historically, geographically, and currently. The Arab world is influencing the Mediterranean. The Islamic world is also exercising a lot of influence. The African world, Europeans, the Atlantic, the Russian, and now the Chinese with the Belt and Road. So there are a lot of things interacting in the Mediterranean. That is what gives Mediterranean its importance. And as you said, uh, Miguel, this is indeed a, the center of the world with all the politics coming into it, competing, and producing good things and bad things. The session before that, the moderator mentioned something about NATO and what the NATO has done in the Mediterranean by way of uh, uh, showing the positive side. And it mentioned that uh, the NATO contributed in eliminating Colonel Gaddafi. But then what after that? In fact, they created a major problem in Libya, in North Africa, and in Africa, and in fact in the whole basin of the Mediterranean. So we have to get back to the basics. What happened in the Mediterranean? And is the, the, this relationship between NATO and and the Mediterranean, because the discussion has shown that whatever you talk about the uh, 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 Atlantic space, uh, the Atlantic dynamics, etc., it boils down to the NATO, yeah. its policies, its presence, and actions. This is the thing that we have to be aware of, Mediterranean and NATO. For the, the, what was mentioned briefly, the cooperation between Latin America and Africa, this is not in the meaning of this panel or this meeting. Yes, indeed, this, those are relations of uh, trade, of investment, etc. but they have not reached the point or the level of being strategic relationship. The, the one in the north is touching on issues of peace, of security, of development, of the strategy in the uh, world. I have together with Miguel, together with Hubert Vidrin and Juppé, etc., worked to establish the Mediterranean policy. And we started with the Mediterranean Forum in 1993 and 1994. Then the Barcelona process in 1995. Then the President Sarkozy initiative about the Mediterranean uh, Union of the Mediterranean in 2008. And in fact, until now, and this, this very moment, we have not succeeded in putting forward a sustainable policy for the Mediterranean. And, and that be, that's because of what? Mistrust or just uh, lack of chemistry? It is good that you, you use the word mistrust, but this mistrust is not playing its effect within the Mediterranean alone, but vis-a-vis -vis the NATO. And if the NATO really wants to rebuild relations with the Mediterranean countries and with Africa and with the rest, the term is confidence building. Confidence building. The, what happened before, 
during the Cold War and after the Cold War, and when, what we have seen in Libya, what we have seen in several other places, call for a reconsideration of the whole policy, how NATO and the politicians of NATO deal with the rest. The Mediterranean is a sea with the North members of NATO, all of them, and the South, none member of NATO's, all of us. Miguel, do you agree with that mistrust between NATO well, and the... NATO was very badly perceived by the southern part of uh, the Mediterranean countries. I remember before the Iraqi war and certain attempts from NATO to really engage with some Arab countries uh, before, I can't remember his name, he was the predecessor of uh, Javier Solana, Secretary General of NATO. They tried to engage with some Arab countries and it was a total refusal. There was the, this perception that the NATO was a kind of conspiracy against the Arab world, the Muslim world. So uh, NATO understood that and uh, addressed the issue in a different manner. And now, as uh, Amr say, and today, I think there is a good cooperation between NATO and Mediterranean countries. But nevertheless, don't mix issues. I mean, I mean NATO, uh, with all my respect to NATO, have a very clear article uh, you know, charter, uh, and they have auto zone, auto area. They have not to intervene everywhere. I mean, uh, and we have to be clear about that. So let's go to the real issues and take the countries, the people of the region to do what have to be done by themselves. And I think uh, what in Barcelona process, then you know, from Mediterranean, was a lack of political will. There was, of course, a permanent crisis in the Middle East and the lack of solving the Palestinian-Israeli issue that intervened in a very negative moment for enhancing the security of the region. But there is many other issues that have to be addressed. And that's one of you mentioned is uh, immigration, where the Atlantic perspective and the Mediterranean one cross each other. I mean, because that is where the world, sub-Saharan Africa, coming from uh, the west part of Africa, go up to the Mediterranean and to Europe. So the problem now, and that there has been a lot of attempt, there has been a lot of, uh, you know, proposal, and uh, well, it has been said, it's not me, but the people and, and the analysts and the politicians have said that the Spanish-Morocco relation have been quite successful because both countries uh, that we have this geopolitical chance, we have to say that. Morocco and Spain, uh, maybe we have not so, so potential in other areas, but geopolitically speaking, I don't think in this area, uh, Morocco and Spain have, uh, they are Mediterranean, they are Atlantic, we are Europe, Africa, so we are very well placed to really uh, cooperate together. And we cooperate together in order to solve this uh, permanent uh, concern about uh, illegal immigration. And we called for a conference in Rabat, 2008, was a great success, and then Marrakesh uh, just uh, one, a week ago, or last weekend. Um, what happened? Why we don't solve that? From my point of view, because we lack uh, to really engage in a much more political oriented uh, you know, approach. Uh, till now, migration has been addressed and uh, be part of the Ministry of Interior uh, in order to protect borders, in order to protect, uh, you know, the, you know, the extra um, territory of the of the nations and diplomacy. Uh, I want to be uh, concrete and very, very, uh, very simple. Uh, there has been no great diplomacy and immigration problem. There is a lack of foreign ministers and foreign affairs to get involved in migration. And immigration, if I'm correct, are people who come in from abroad. I mean, it's an international issue. It's not internal issue. Integration of communities is an internal issue. But immigration is external issue. And foreign affairs has not been addressing this issue. Because they say, no, let's put more vessels, let's put more control, let's put more patrols, let's put more military controls. 
let's put more fences, let's put more walls. <clears throat> At the end of the day, they will continue to come. They will. If you have been trying from the foreign policy, you will see what are the root causes. Because there's poverty, there is no development, there is no rule of law, there's a lack of cooperation, no alliance, no corresponsibility. And that's what has to be done. Amri Musa, let's face it, maybe there is no... We've to discuss migration. <laughs> We've come back to migration. But let's face it, maybe there is no political will here. Maybe Europe has their own challenges right now. And the last thing on their mind is people on boats crossing the Mediterranean. They've got bigger issues. There is a political will and political decision on how to deal with, the, with Africa, the Middle East, the Arab world, the violent trends, etc. But from the discussion of today and yesterday and the special mention of Africa, I see, I can smell that wind of Cold War in Africa are going to blow. It's not a question of how to help Africa. It's a question of how to stop China from its uh, very, very wide uh, stride within Africa and of the Belt and Road, One Belt, One Road project to get into Africa. And China, in fact, is very active there. So I see that many of the plans, you talk about NATO, you talk about Africa, and here when you talk about NATO and Africa at the same time, there must be something military, something different than what we are talking about, development, reform, etc. So NATO is not for reform, it's not an organization that is uh, established in order to reform or to help uh, the, the, uh, uh, the developing nations. It has its own task. So I would warn now, don't draw Africa into the upcoming Cold War. As you know, there are so many uh, military bases now in Africa. Not only uh, the, the Africa come. No, there's an, another. There's so many bases in, on, in the Red Sea, from Japan to China to Turkey to you name it. And the, uh, the Chinese presence, the Turkish <coughs> presence, the Iranian presence, etc. I see something dangerous very much coming up in Africa, involving Africa. And I believe we in Africa will have to be very worried about that and very cautious about that. Not to stop cooperation. We have to cooperate even with NATO. But we have to know our limits and the, the slippery ground which we have to avoid. Yeah, um without uh, delving too much because it's not part of this topic. He says stopping China. How do you do that? No, I'm not um, in this business of stopping China, nor can we stop it, nor can you stop it. No, we can't. No. But you can coordinate. And this war of uh, trade, uh, that trade war, yeah. this, it, it has its own dynamics. And between the US and China in particular, after the meeting in, in, in Buenos Aires, we, we found some, some hope but it seems that it's still very difficult. Miguel. But they are going to address this issue, the trade war between both of them. Yeah. The best way forward, Miguel, in your opinion, to, to, to bring the symbiosis, to bring this, these two groups together, what, what is the best way forward? Well, I believe in institution myself. I'm a politician. Uh, I think institution is the the higher degree of understanding how you can solve problems through peaceful means. And institutions are the ones who can't really, you know, give a final answer. John Monet said, men disappear, institutions remain. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what is we are looking to this uh, problem today that either on the Atlantic facade or in the Mediterranean, we don't have a strong institutions. Well, we try with the Barcelona. We have, uh, well, Fatala Sihidmarsi with us, the Secretariat of the Union for the Mediterranean. It have to be uh, reinforced, have to be revisited, have to be. We need the Europeans by themselves and African and Mediterranean countries to really come to certain degrees of understanding and to re reinforce the Mediterranean policy, the Mediterranean institution. There is no. no there is a crisis in Libya. There is a crisis in the Middle East. There is a crisis in energy, for instance. There are, 
gas and oil in the southern east of, uh, of the Mediterranean. And instead of creating together uh, Turkey, Cyprus, Egypt, uh, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, a common share of the energy, they are fighting each other. Lack of institutions. So we have tried to organize again with the Mediterranean spirit a strong Mediterranean architecture. And at the same time, on the Atlantic facade, is uh, there is nothing. Hmm? There is a North Atlantic Treaty. Okay, this is good. We are, uh, I signed the Lisbon Treaty myself. So as uh, Joao said, uh, is the pillar for European security. Okay, but what is going on? The Atlantic facade down to, to Africa. What are the relations between the African European facade with the North America and Latin America facade of Atlantic? There is no cooperation, there is nothing. You the Americans have invaded with the Pacific, the APEC. And every year, President Trump or President Obama before used to go to China or to Japan and they have a stream advanced cooperation between the Pacific area. On the Atlantic, there is nothing. There's only the North Atlantic Treaty. Okay, that's military, it's the threat of Russia. But what about the Atlantic people? So we have to invent, uh, they say to me, we launch uh, during my time of foreign minister initiative in Lanzarote to have the South Atlantic rela relationship. Well. Brazilian didn't like it because uh, they say, no, that is our, our, our protagonism. So they, 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 they do what kind of thing, not because they come from Spain. It's a, it's a stupid attitude, but well, I hope that now we will recognize that something has to be done between the two Atlantic shores. And if we have these two institutions, then let's go to work together and then make the two institutions on the Mediterranean Atlantic work together with the specific uh, ideas and action plan. But um, again, I think uh, the time has come for new creative ideas. I mean, uh, the world has changed. We all come here every year and say, well, the world has changed. Everybody knows their words are changed, but we don't do anything. We continue with the same procedure, the same language, the same concept, the same initiative, the same institution. Uh, diplomacy has been always the art to respond to the new challenge of every chapter of the humanity. Yeah. And we have created that we have uh, diplomats and politicians to come with new ideas, new proposals. You know what, so you know we what, have Miguel, to do so. You know what, Miguel, someone said that the definition of insanity is doing something over and over again and expecting a different result. Yeah. That's what you're talking about. Yeah. We mm -hmm. keep coming here and talk about the same thing. Yeah. At the end of the day, Amre Musa, regional integration, because popularism is growing around the world. Right. Europe, the US. What about here, Northern Africa? Regional integration? Regional integration, I suggest that we use a different term. Regional cooperation institutionalized, based on mutual interests, common interests. We started that, but it, we were interrupted. Back in uh, 2011, here in Agadir, with the, the initiative of Mohammed bin Isa, who was the foreign minister at that time, Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, and Jordan signed a free trade agreement. This agreement of four out of 22 Arab countries should be the nucleus for the future cooperation. The four should be six, should be eight. We're not calling on all members of the Arab League to join, but exactly as the Europeans started back in 1956, that there were six European countries, and then today there are 28. Uh, this is exactly what I mean, or I, I would accept your uh, terminology as region, regional integration. Is that working? Based on, on something concrete and on economic basis. And also, we have to bear in mind and give due attention to the cultural side, especially today, with the misunderstanding between civilizations, the, between cultures, 
And I'm glad that Muhammad uh, bin Isa has an article here, uh, one or two points he explained. And also, we should be glad that Miguel Moratinos is with us. He has been appointed and going starting next January as the High Representative of the Secretary General of the United Nations for Alliance of Civilizations. Mm -hmm. So we started to give this dimension its due importance, not only the economic compact or the political compact or the security compact, but also the cultural one. And even when we talk about NATO, the relationship between NATO, the world of NATO, and the world of the Mediterranean or any other world, it is not only economy, it is on, not only security, but also the cultural dimension. The, the interaction between civilizations, between cultures, between the way we all think, this is our savior. We are not going to change or to move, except with the, this will, determination to build understanding between cultures and not to let things go as they are, this is happening today that would lead definitely to another confrontation after confrontation, resulting in terrorism, resulting in poverty, mismanagement of, of governments, resulting in the migration in order not to say that I didn't mention or to t say something about migration. Yeah, and, and of course, missed opportunities. We keep missing it every time. Oh, yes, we are very good at that. We're very good oh, at that. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> especially in our world. <laughs> <laughs> Miguel, I'll have you say the last word before we move forward. Moving forward. Moving forward, I mean, the first and absolutely essential is to want to move forward. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, and that is very... Uh, the, the point I have been witnessing the last years is there is a lack of determination to move forward. Mm. There is a kind of... Uh, paralysis uh, that say, well, it's too risky, it's, uh, we don't know what can happen, uh, but, you know, if you don't want to move forward, you don't want to solve the problem, you don't want to create a kind of understanding how we should uh, deal the, the issues together, they will continue to be, because there is a lack of, uh, let's say, collective leadership, because now, unfortunately, it's not... Yesterday, Madeleine was said, this is true, the U.S. is the dispensable uh, partner, but she said, the U.S. need others. So we need this collective leadership to start to move forward. I mean, with all my respect to, uh, to the G20, they were meeting in Buenos Aires. It was a fantastic gathering. My uh, president of the government was there. That was the most representative. Well, if I had been there, Instead of discussing if we have a trade agreement or we have, a, you know, this, uh, I would say, surplus out, papers out. And I would say, what we are going to organize the life of the future? How can we live together? <laughs> and then we start to, you can kind of start to work. But we, we continue to have meetings and, and summits and uh, encounters. Yeah. But if you don't want really to, to move to a better world, to try to reform the UN, to try to reform what has to be reformed, and so uh, we will yeah. continue to have this meeting and having the same analysis, good diagnosis, but nothing on the ground. But Miguel, maybe you make a really valid point. Maybe the world did need to be shaken up a little. Maybe you needed a Trump out there or a Brexit. President maybe Trump we were too right. comfortable. President Trump is shaking the world. Yes. Yes. So maybe that's what we you, need. You need more. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you agree? In a way, we were too complacent, too comfortable. No, no, no. <laughs> you know, people say that uh, well, the League of Nations came after the First World War. Yeah. You had the United Nations in San Francisco after the Second. So we need a Third World War. That's a stupid. It's uh, unacceptable. Yeah. May, think, maybe I not think, extreme. Uh, I think. I think uh, the world have understood what means war then, and having this uh, disaster, hmm? mm -hmm. uh, Holocaust and, 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 and the rest of that. So at least the people who are aware of the challenges should start to move and have no be fear about what is going to happen mm -hmm. if they take some initiative. So 
Uh, that will be, I think, a collective responsibility. In today's world, it's not only the leaders, it's not only nation state, it's the private sector, as we say, the civil society. Everybody has to be in this partnership, this global partnership, that make, uh, could make the, the world better. Amri Musa, final, final word, going forward. Let us hope for the best. But no, people always say of, that. This is too idealistic. Well, uh, instead of what Moratinos is saying about going straight forward to the point, unfortunately, we are going in circles. In circles. We haven't yet broken the, this stalemate. And, of course, the same people. We are all, our generation, we are trying to break those uh, barriers. Uh, but I hope that with the advent of women and young people, they will introduce a new spirit into this struggle for the future. This is a must. The 21st century has its own call, its own spirit, its own dynamics. And I always say so, that it is the 21st century. You cannot deal with the problems the same way as we were doing in the 60s and 70s. This is over. This is over and must be over. And the, the 21st century, the new, the, the, the new discoveries, the science, the technology, etc., will impose a different way of action, a different way of, of doing things than it has been before. I am sure of that. I am so hopeful about it. Amri Musa, former Secretary General, Arab League, Miguel Angel Moratinos, former Minister of Foreign Affairs, Spain. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. We thank you, Jeff. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I'm going I'm to let my guests go. We have five more panelists coming. We can discuss. If you want to make a point, we can do that right now, actually, as we set up. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Okay, Another round you. of applause for my uh, guests, okay. please. Bye-bye. Thank you. Shukran. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, sir. Good job. Okay. All right. As we're setting up, does anyone have a comment right now? I'm sure you do. A couple of comments. There you go. There's a microphone. There's a lady in the front here who's raring to go. Oh, you, you want to go, sir? Go on. Say something. Tell us who you are, who you represent. It is on the same topic. It's okay. It's okay. You can say it. But there'll be no answer unless it, you want me to answer. Well, I, I wanted to interact with them if they are not here, so it's not <laughs> working. <laughs> you want to no, do because, it? No, they, we had, I think, we, we have tackled the very important issues. Yeah. And we are, I think, we are lacking some perspective. By the way, can you tell us your name? Uh, my name is Youssef Armani. I'm former Minister of the Foreign Affairs of Africa, Morocco. So I think today we have talked about everything. But the most important is we have failed today in our region to, when I'm talking region, mean north and south. Yeah, yeah. Lack of ambition of the European Union as far as neighborhood policy. We didn't, take, didn't talk about it. Lack of regional, you mentioned regional integration in the region, and especially in the Maghreb. And it is a nonsense that we are not able to bid up coherent schemes. We didn't talk about job creation, promotion of growth, because this is the most important today. It's coming up right now. Yeah, no, but for, for the region, because when we're talking about the Mediterranean, yes. Europe, Sahel, and Africa, this all issue interconnected. But we and, have to, and maybe it's because of lack of political will. No, we need, I think, three elements. We need leadership, we need commitment, and we need vision. And unfortunately, these three elements today are lacking in our region. We fail at the level of the Maghreb, of the Arab League. You know? yeah. I wanted to interact with Al Musa. He was Secretary General of the Arab League. How to work on policy and defense. And also, we talk about migration, and we didn't, we didn't talk about one of the major issues today we're all facing in Europe, in the Mediterranean, is how to fight terrorism. Today, we cannot only, through security measures, fight terrorism. We didn't talk about the narrative, how to deconstruct. Some issues I need, we, we, had, we, we lost a lot of time on NATO, which is not a major player today no. in the region. NATO, for the Mediterranean, is, for us, is nonsense, because we have tried to work with NATO. We had only one hour meeting with the ministers a year, uh, Fatallah, in Brussels, on the margin of the NATO meeting. So I want also to interact with this. Unfortunately, we didn't have time, so... You, you know what? You will have time, because we're going to continue this conversation, the human dimension of, of migration. We can continue that, and you can ask those questions to my guests who are coming up. And this is a, uh, a wonderful, amazing panel, and I'm, I'll introduce them one by one, starting with Lloyd Axworthy. He's the chair of the World Refugee Council. A round of applause for him, please. <clears throat> Lloyd, where are you? 
Right behind him is Munia Busta. She's the secretary to the state of the Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation here in the Kingdom of Morocco. Welcome, Excellence. Uh, next is Abdullah Koulibaly. He's the president of Bamako Forum Foundation based out of Mali. Please come up. Mm -hmm. Next is Biram Diop, Special Chief of Staff to the President of the Republic of Senegal Armed Forces, Senegal. And last but not least, Maria Teresa Fernandez de la Vega, President of the Women for Africa Foundation, President of the Council of State, Spain. How are you? <laughs> welcome all, welcome, welcome. Lloyd? You okay? Here I am. Welcome, sir. Good, thank you very much. A lot of questions already being raised, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure you listened to that uh, session. Why are two women sitting together and two men together? <laughs> no. that's, that's not fair. Let's switch, let's switch, let's switch. We want boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl. Boy, girl. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's just be fair, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, there you go. There you go. Ah, oh, perfect. It was natural. <laughs> it was natural. Women go together. Well, all right. <laughs> Straight to the you guys heard a discussion earlier on. Any comments, real quick, before we go on? Any comments offhand? Anybody? I'll throw it out there. We have enough to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I say there's lack of political will. The gentleman up front here says lack of leadership, lack of vision, <clears throat> and lack of commitment. Do you guys agree? Well. Madam Busset, do you agree? Uh, he's, he's my boss. I can't believe it. Your boss is in the front row. <laughs> Maybe you should take a coffee break. <laughs> You're listening. Kulibali. <laughs> okay. Monsieur le ministre, ce que vous avez dit est vrai. Problème de leadership. Just yours or mine. Mais on est véritablement par rapport à la crise que nous vivons. Uh, où on voit dans nos pays les gens aller braver le désert, les océans, mourir. Et quand ils partent de l'autre côté, on les traite comme des animaux. Et quand on entend des gens dire, aujourd'hui dans nos pays, on se sent étranger parce qu'on entend des enfants parler arabe. Où sommes-nous On a oublié le passé. Et ce que vous dites est tellement vrai que pour que ces gens quittent nos pays pour partir là-bas, c'est parce qu'ils vivent mal là où ils sont. Et quand on vit mal chez soi, une des raisons fondamentales, c'est le problème de gouvernance. Au cœur de la gouvernance, c'est un problème de leadership, un problème de vision. Et donc, vous avez totalement raison de parler de ça. Mais seulement, quand le drame concerne les êtres humains, Aujourd'hui, nous devons nous arrêter pour dire, face au drame humain, arrêtons de mettre ce qu'on appelle les lois. Le seul droit qu'il faut, c'est le droit de la protection de l'être humain. Donc nous sommes au cœur de la problématique de cette thématique, la dimension humaine de la crise migratoire. Et ce problème de leadership va aussi au niveau international. Parce que si les gens sont partis, c'est parce que certains ont été bombardés chez eux sans rien demander. Oui, et ça aussi c'est un leadership, mais un mauvais leadership. L'arrogance d'un leadership qui amène des flots de gens dans la nature et accompagne avec ça ce qu'ils appellent l'insécurité. Donc vous avez raison, monsieur le ministre, en mettant l'accent sur le leadership. Moi, je m'en arrête là. Merci, merci. Uh, Maria Teresa, you wanted to say something? Sí. Sí, a mí me gustaría señalar que vivimos una época en la que hay dos conceptos, globalización y universalidad, que van separados. Se ha globalizado la economía, se ha globalizado la información, la tecnología. Eso es lo que se ha globalizado. Lo que no se ha globalizado son lo que significa la universalidad de los derechos de los valores y de la democracia. Y hemos llegado a una situación, sobre todo desde, después de la crisis del 2008, en donde se ha producido en el mundo el mayor nivel de desigualdad de la historia. El 1% del mundo, del capital, tiene 
el 90% de la riqueza. Y el resto, el 99% del mundo, tiene el 10% de la riqueza. ¿Cómo no va a haber migración? Va a haber migración y va a seguir habiendo migración. Más allá de que yo creo que la migración no es un problema, sino que es una realidad histórica porque ha existido siempre. La gente se mueve, los países viajan, pero ahora de una manera particular. Porque estamos abordando la migración sin control. Y por tanto, lo que se está produciendo es más desigualdad esos movimientos migratorios. Y yo creo que sí que falta una visión política de entendimiento de cuál es el auténtico problema. Y el auténtico problema deriva de la desigualdad. Así de claro, en todos los ámbitos. A partir de ahí podemos empezar a hablar. Absolutely. Biram Diop, um, I have traveled the world and there's probably no country on the planet that I've been to haven't found a Senegalese there. I don't know why, but they're always Senegalese saying Mengedef, Magnifique, all that stuff. I'm I don't know. And Senegal is a pretty stable country. So, I mean, it's, uh, what's the problem? <laughs> You're chief of staff to the president, so you should know. Huh? <laughs> Thank you very much for this uh, provocation. <laughs> I, I, I just would like to highlight the fact that I am still an active duty officer, so you will understand easily that I will not be able to be discussing the political dimension of this subject. And it was agreed among the panelists that I will be the technician of the panel. So I will be only addressing technical aspects of what we will be discussing. Okay, here. so technically. Now, technically, I can uh, respond to you and saying that Senegal is a country of migration. It's not because people feel discriminated or feel not at ease or feel that their basic human rights are violated or they are uh, running out of hunger that they are migrating. Migration, in my opinion, is in the DNA of Senegalese. And it has been going very well so far, up until the beginning of the years 2000, when we started having crisis in our migration system. And that's when Senegal has decided to put in place structures I will be talking about later, I am very honored to be responsible of, and that are in a continuous processing and monitoring and evaluation of the migration situation in Senegal so that we can give timely responses mm. to the difficulties our migrants are facing abroad. So I will keep my intervention there and we'll come back later on the architecture we have available in Senegal that is providing so far very good result in the containment of all these unsafe and unmanaged migration crisis. And it can work in other countries or for other migrants, uh, maybe? You know, everything is contextual. Mm. There's nothing you can cut and paste elsewhere and expect that it can work exactly the same way. Sure. It is working where it is originated. But you can learn from others' experience and contextualize. Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, the Senegalese experience, yes, can be contextualized in other countries. Okay. Yeah. Lloyd Axworthy, mm -hmm. as the chair of the World Refugee Council. And the number of refugees are still continue to rise around the planet, huh? Uh, yeah. And we can talk about insecurity, we can talk about uh, bad leadership, we can talk about lack of opportunities, jobs, etc. That's not going to help, is it? No. What, what is? Well, I think we have to uh, begin to uh, descend a little bit in our discussion from 30,000 feet and broad categories whether it's leadership or inequality, I'm not, not being critical, and get down to concrete 
reasons why people move, why people are displaced. Conflict. Uh, and there is no accountability for those who are creating the conflict. There's no, our security system uh, designed through the UN at some point or the regional organizations simply doesn't hold those accountable who have caused the large movement of people by their own actions of greed or ideology or whatever it may be. Uh, the refugee system is uh, going broke. It's fundamentally underfunded and uh, not capable of meeting its demands. And I think the sooner we get down to talking about very specific issues, which I think on the Council we discovered in Africa, in Asia, in the Americas, everywhere, that there is simply uh, a major fall off of uh, commitments. You know, when you think about it, the importance of mass movements of people now in the range of 60, 70 million, growing at a range of three or four million a year, and that you're trying to pay for it through a donation voluntary system. You know, it's like trying to raise money for your, your daughter's spring prom. Uh, and what the results are is that in many cases, the demands to be able to meet basic humanitarian needs, food, um, education, has fallen. Yeah. Uh, and as a result, the, until you begin to fix that financial system. Now, uh, part of the problem that uh, I wanted to raise that while the, the compact, I think, is a very important document in setting out aspirations and getting commitments, what it doesn't do is really come up with very, uh, what I would call specific plumbing answers. Yeah. And when I was a foreign minister, I always thought my job was to fix the leaks, uh, except now it's also fixing the architecture with it. So, you know, you have a chance where Uganda has a million people coming in, they hold a pledging conference, they get 30% of what was required, and of that 30%, only 20% is delivered. So as a result, you have large numbers of children suffering from malnutrition, even though they're under UN uh, jurisdiction. That, that's, that's one example. And, then, and so until we begin addressing that issue uh, in, a, in a regional, continental way, and also begin to change the terms by which we we accept that this movement is going to take place. Uh, it's going to grow. It's going to be increasingly um, more complex because the old definition of refugee is simply worn out. Uh, something that was designed in the Second World War doesn't apply to uh, Lagos, which is going to be swept by rising seawater and the 10 million people uh, looking for some place to land. So the large parts of these movements and I think at the same time, we've been facing a, a very major uh, setbacks in the way in which uh, the responsibilities to share have been withdrawn. And uh, let's face it, also donor fatigue. Well, it's a, it's a donor fatigue. It's also a system breakdown. It was, it was based upon the notion that somehow, when, when I was a Minister of Immigration back in the 80s, I, I know I don't look that old, but I am, but uh, uh, we had a group of 21 countries uh, that was coordinating its actions to deal with the boat people coming out of the breakdown in, uh, in Indochina. Now, uh, at best, we have maybe seven or eight donors who are actually actively contributing. Uh, and as a result, uh, the big problem, the big dilemma, is where does it go? And especially if we're trying to reform the system, which I think is, is really should be the ambition of this organization, to be part of a reform movement, and I know that may scare some people, but by reform I mean changing the fundamental ways in which you, you manage these things, uh, you're going to have to come to, to agree with the accountability of people who make promises to do donations and never deliver. And until you come to grips with that, that's another form of accountability. Yeah, maybe people don't care anymore. So. Well, they don't care, but there's also the politics of it. I mean, you know, we've been generated a, a distemper in our times, we've got political leaders uh, who are basically exploiting uh, the notion of immigration and refugees. Look, can I give you an example? Because it's very, uh, it's very uh, disturbing to me. I just came back last week from the uh, Mexican-American uh, border where they, many of you have seen the pictures of people in the, in the caravans moving up from Central America where they're escaping the gangs and the violence. Uh, and I started talking to people in the camps and to the to my dismay and certainly 
to their frustration, they discovered that six months earlier, the United States had eliminated two grounds of criteria for refugee status, sort of general violence and gang violence. So the women in the camp have no basis for applying. The guys are okay. I mean, they'll be able to make their case, not easily. But women are just simply caught in a box. They've got nowhere to go. And there is the kind of thing that has to be fixed. Now, how do you hold people accountable for that? Because we're all sort of caught up in that's, that's a decision by one country uh, to deal with its border in another way. Yeah. And the whole notion that, uh, as we say in, in playing uh, billiards, you know, one hit on a ball is going to hit others along the way. There's always a consequence. So, I mean, that's my concern, is to now that we've got a, a compact and virtually agreed to and have decided at the General Assembly mm -hmm. that we can move on to very specific, clear agreements about how to fix the system. Sure. Let me, let me be a little provocative. Munia Busta, let me come to you yes. and be a little bit provocative. The northern border of Morocco, right? What's the closest point between Morocco and Europe? 10 kilometers less? 13 kilometers. 13 kilometers? Yeah. Okay. So how come you don't have Moroccans streaming into Europe like you have West Africans or Central Africans or other Africans? How come? Are we going to come back to leadership and opportunities and, 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 and GDP? Is, is that what it is? Or? Okay, uh, I will start first by highlighting some points. Um, we all know that uh, migration is a natural historical phenomenon and that contributes to development of countries. Uh, the problem is the mismanagement of migration that really creates a cri crisis and that really creates threats. Migration itself is not threats, but it, the mismanagement of migration is threats. And for that reason, what, um, when we want to approach or to say what should be the, the, the right approach to, uh, to find solution, we should have a global approach. Security in itself is not sufficient. If I take the case of Morocco, we have more than so three shifts of 7,000 of persons that control the borderline in land and in maritime. But that's, uh, uh, even we have all the persons mobilized, uh, smugglers and traffickers are not discouraged. And uh, the fin we, because there are other reasons that we should treat and we should address. First of all, I think is the, uh, we have to act at regional cooperation. And Morocco is developing cooperation with its neighboring, especially with Spain. And uh, according to statistics, we have uh, dismantled from 2012 to 2017 more than 400 uh, trafficking uh, networks. And only for this year, we have about 100 of uh, trafficking networks. So that shows that there is, uh, we have to mobilize. We, have, we need regional international mobilization for that to combat uh, all these practices. But it's not, as I said, the security is not the only approach that we should adopt. We have to see how we can uh, create, uh, how can we uh, combat the origin and the, the root reasons of the immigration. Mm. The question of development, we, we talk about that. How can we create more opportunities of job? How can we create more st political stability? That's, that's the point. But the, the grass is not really green on the other side most of the time, is it? I mean, mm -hmm. let's face it. Yeah. But how do you convince them? Yeah, that, that's, I know that now there is debate. It's the rise of populism. We see it in, uh, in Europe, in the United States, but they, they don't bring any solution. They just put uh, pressure on government, create tension in society, but without any tangible result. The only response that we have on table is the global compact for safe, regular, and uh, organized um, uh, migration. And I think that is very important to say that the unique opportunity to address this uh, question, this issue, uh, globally, uh, the, uh, in a multilateral con uh, context, and to uh, give the importance and, uh, to the migrants, the rights of migrants, to uh, the, uh, the development both in country of origin and country of destination. Yeah. Lloyd, hold on a second. I think uh, Abdullahi Kulibali wants to say something. And while you think about that, Mali is one of the safest, most tranquil, peaceful countries in West Africa. Mm. I've been to Timbuktu at its height, Tombuktu. Is, and now, terrorism, insecurity has almost destroyed Mali of all countries. Mm. But anyway, what, what were you going to say? 
Ok. Euh, je pense d'abord que vous parlez de la migration et de ses conséquences, il faut surtout essayer de planter les décors pour que les gens partent. C'est vrai qu'il y a une dimension culturelle. Dans certains pays, certaines communautés partent toujours. Mais toute la population ne part pas toujours. Quand vous voyez les gens partir en masse, c'est que sont fins rond. Les gens ne sont pas bien chez eux. Quand on est bien, on ne part pas. Et quand on part, on revient toujours quand on est bien chez soi. Donc la cause profonde, comme l'a dit notre collègue, un des éléments importants au-delà de la malgouvernance, il y a le changement climatique qui est une réalité. Parce qu'aujourd'hui, dans le monde rural, les zones qui sont inondées, les gens n'arrivent plus à cultiver. Donc il n'y a plus de récolte. Les paysans ne restent plus là où ils sont et partent vers les villes et après partent loin. C'est un des éléments assez importants. Mais l'autre élément important, c'est l'injustice dans nos pays. Quand l'argent, les ressources de nos pays sont mal gérées, les gens n'ont pas de perspective. Quand on n'a pas de perspective, on part pour chercher de meilleures perspectives. Alors maintenant, le, la chose la plus importante par rapport au pays de destination, généralement, lorsque les politiques de visa, nous, quand on était étudiants, il y a une quarantaine d'années, les gens partaient en Europe et revenaient facilement chez eux, parce que tu savais qu'en partant, tu pouvais revenir sans problème. Les politiques de visa poussent aussi à la clandestinité. Donc il est important de voir toute cette dynamique pour faciliter l'aller-retour des gens dans les pays. Parce que ça, c'est assez important. Et ça nous amène au problème euh, des, des trafiquants. Parce que ce que Madame le ministre vient de dire, c'est vrai, il y a des trafiquants. Mais pourquoi il y a des trafiquants Parce qu'ils voient que les gens ont des barrières, ils ne peuvent pas aller. On commence à jouer avec les gens. Et ainsi, votre chaîne CNN a montré des scènes horribles d'esclavage des temps modernes ouais. en Libye. Ouais. Pourquoi tout ça arrive Parce qu'on a essayé de mettre des barrières. Et tant qu'il y a ce système de barrières, nous aurons face à ce problème qui nous amène à la thématique, la dimension humaine de la crise migratoire. Maintenant, comment gérer le problème Quel est le véritable problème Nous pensons qu'il nous faut donner des perspectives aux populations là où ils sont, le développement. Euh, mon collègue et ami sénégalais vient de dire que tous les Sénégalais ont toujours, sont toujours partis. Mais... Les côtes ouest africaines, dans le temps, il y avait beaucoup de poissons. Les gens avaient tout. Les pêcheurs ne partaient pas. Aujourd'hui, des pêcheurs sénégalais partent. Parce qu'il y a des accords qui font que ceux qui ont des, des filets avec des mailles à se faire viennent tout prendre, sans perspective. Certains qui ne partaient pas partent. Donc il y a aussi un problème d'accord avec les pays qui ont plus de moyens que les pays africains. Donc il est important d'aller vers les causes profondes. Maintenant, et, 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 le plus important pour vous, mais comment faire qu'un pays comme le Mali, aujourd'hui, qui fait une sorte de havre de paix, se trouve dans le désordre Au-delà de tout ce que je viens de dire, c'est d'abord un problème d'équité, de justice. Parce que personne ne se lève de lui-même pour se révolter s'il est bien. Donc il faut créer les conditions pour que les gens soient bien là où ils sont. Ça, c'est le premier point. Et le deuxième point, pour travailler dans tout ça, il y a un partenariat. Que l'argent qui est donné pour le développement aille dans les vrais projets de développement. Le gros problème que nous avons souvent dans pas mal de pays, les ressources données pour les projets de développement ne partent pas vers les vrais destinataires. Donc le véritable défi que nous avons, c'est de pas de donner de l'argent, c'est de donner de l'argent probablement à des sociétés privées euh, ou à des structures, en tout cas bien contrôlées, qui vont permettre que l'argent aille aux bénéficiaires. C'est un premier oh. élément que je pense assez important dans nos pays. Mais quand on donne de l'argent aux gens, l'un des éléments importants, parce que pour créer de l'emploi, il faut de l'industrie. Donc il est important qu'on amène des infrastructures dans nos pays, des infrastructures dans le monde rural, qui vont permettre de transformer nos produits. C'est dans la transformation qu'on donne de l'emploi au plus grand nombre. Et quand le plus grand nombre a du travail, il y a moins de migration. Donc, on a le défi de la transformation de l'économie. OK, good points. Uh, Biram Diop, I see you nodding quite a bit. You must agree with some of the stuff that... Uh, yeah, I, 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 I just would like to come back to the root causes and the drivers. <laughs> Very often, we base our conclusions on presumptions. In my opinion, we need to do a better job 
in reaching out to the migrants, to the returnees, and talking to them to know exactly what are the real reasons why they migrated. So that we know exactly what are the causes and give the adequate response to that or put in place the preventive mechanism that will prevent those migrations to happen. You actually think you need to talk to the migrants? Oh, and oh, for sure. We need to do a better job in reaching out to the migrants to know exactly why they are going. We tend to presume that we know why they are going. And as the academics are saying, you need to problematize first to solve the solution, to solve the problem. If you don't know the, pro the exact problem, you will be solving different things. So it's very important. The data is important. Intelligence gathering is very important so that we can combat or we can prevent. But combating, preventing are impossible if we do not have an approach that takes into consideration the international dimension of the problem. We need to work internationally with our partners, with our allies. We need also to make sure that we mobilize our entire nation on these very critical difficulties we are facing now in migration crisis. But also focus on the local dimension of the problem. And finally, make sure that, yes, the state actors are part of the solution, but the non-state actors also are part of the solution. Mm. So I will keep it there to not monopolize the, 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 the floor. But later on, I can come back to concrete actions that have been taken by the Senegalese government to address all these root causes yeah. and drivers. I'd like to hear that, actually. But, Lloyd, in the meantime, you and then uh, Munia will come back to you. It's in the same sense. I wanted to come back to the point of exchange of data and information. And I wanted to also signal that Sa Majesté le Roi, Mohamed VI, the Roi du Maroc, is the leader of the question of migration at the level of the Union African. Et que dans ce cadre, il y a eu la présentation de l'agenda africain de la migration qui a été présenté, adopté, et que l'une des questions prioritaires, c'est de créer l'observatoire de la migration, justement pour être dans ce sens d'idée de pouvoir avoir des études, des analyses qui puissent permettre de comprendre ces phénomènes migratoires. Parce qu'en général, la migration en Afrique, on a constaté que, que 4 sur 5 migrants africains restent en Afrique. Donc c'est un phénomène panafricain qu'il y a lieu d'analyser, d'observer pour mieux anticiper les politiques à adopter. Ça c'est le premier point. Le deuxième point, et, et je suis tout à fait d'accord, qu'il faudrait adopter des politiques nationales de la migration. C'est également un axe euh, de, ce, de cet agenda africain. Et euh, si je prends le cas du Maroc, euh, cette stratégie a été déjà lancée depuis 2013. Et elle a été bénéfique parce qu'elle nous a permis également de promouvoir, elle nous a permis de promouvoir tout ce qui est migration légale, migration régulière. Parce que, comme je disais, on ne peut pas arrêter des, des processus, des mouvements de personnes. Le plus important, c'est de pouvoir créer des conditions qui permettent de préserver la dignité des migrants, qui leur permettent aussi d'être contributeurs au développement et bien sûr par la régularisation. C'est un processus que nous avons euh, pu mener, mais on peut laisser ça par la suite pour parler des cas pratiques réalisés au niveau de chaque État par rapport hmm. à cette question. OK. Lloyd, what were you going to say uh, before we go on? I'll, well, I'll come I, to you. I agree with the, with the general that you have to get to root causes. It's a question of how to do it. I just finished a year and a half doing it. Our council has met in uh, virtually every part of the world, every hot spot in which refugees themselves were heavily involved in doing the presentations, helping to define what the answers were. Uh, we were not sitting in Geneva or New York in some kind of catacomb uh, looking from you know, the, the, the top floor. We were actually on the ground. And as a result, we were able to draw upon that local knowledge and uh, to also understand the, the grievance that was there. So that you would say, you know, you find in several of the African states who have already, over the last decade, been responsible for the largest acceptance of resettlement. I mean, Africa has had an incredibly effective record 
of opening its borders until the point is there was no money left to do it. And so in one country they would say, we were promised half a billion dollars by the World Bank, and what we were offered was a half a billion dollars in loans. We're not going to use loans to bail out refugees, because is there another way of financing it? I mean, it was a, how do you begin sharing that, uh, that responsibility? That, so that a lot of the prescriptions that are emerging today is to say, well, let's move from a purely humanitarian uh, development capacity to one in which there is a much stronger regional, local control and direction. Again, let, let me give you a, a, I don't want to overwhelm facts, but $8 billion annually is the budget for humanitarian refugee work. About 15% of that actually ends up at the local level. It's all kind of being chewed up and taken in other places. And so you had people who were trying to put together a local irrigation problem, and they were trying to share it with people coming in from another country, but there was no uh, development capacity to do it. So they started having to draw money back from the humanitarian side. It was robbed from Peter to pay Paul. Yeah. And that's, I go back in the sense that uh, until you fix the financial system, and, and in this case, it's not a matter of just taking a wrench and sort of tightening the bolt. You have to think differently. You mean there's corruption at those levels too? Well, here's a good example. Uh, of course there's corruption. And what corruption leads to is a lot of bank accounts sitting around the world uh, as a piggy bank for the leaders of those countries when the time comes. Something like $20 billion has been sort of squired away. Uh, what we're proposing, uh, we'll be releasing this in January, is that we start working with countries to use their court system to reallocate those frozen assets back to the people who were the victims who caused it in the first place. You know, it's uh, the bad guys have to start paying for the good guys that they've, that they've injured. Yeah. And that will then that begin. Happen? And, it, uh, and I think we've already got some interesting, uh, we're meeting with the African Union in a couple of weeks in Colombia. The Swiss has passed legislation, my own country of Canada has. So we're beginning to slowly realize that you have to get out of that kind of uh, refugee convention sort of box that's been sitting there and realize there's a lot of other ways that you have to reallocate uh, funds. And it's not just the funds, it's also the information, it's also who, de who delivers it. Yeah. And I think those are the things that need to be looked at in a much more acute way uh, and start making demands and using the politics. I've been through a, a couple of major political reforms at the international level. I, I took the lead on the, air, on the landmine campaign, for example. We had a, a, a wonderful partnership with NGOs, international institutions, the Red Cross, five or six countries, and we were able to make a shift. I mean, the big issue, that I think, like, coming back, how do you make a change in the international system? How do you break out of, of what has been the conventional wisdom? And to do that, you need to have pretty good street politics. Mm, okay, Maria Teresa, you want to say sí. something? A mí me gustaría volver. Eh, yo la verdad es que me, me gusta muchísimo oír a, a todos mis compañeros de mesa porque todos están en el terreno y conocen mm, cuáles son los problemas. Yo también estoy en el terreno y conozco cuáles son los problemas. Pero yo además de estar en el terreno estoy también en la política y creo que el terreno y la política tienen que estar en la misma línea, en la misma onda. Porque no puede ir la política por un lado y los esfuerzos que hacen las comunidades, las organizaciones, los gobiernos en África o en todo el mundo por otro lado. Porque vivimos en un mundo globalizado, nos guste o no nos guste. Y es muy lamentable que esa globalización haya producido una gran desigualdad. No era previsible, si lo hubiéramos hecho bien, que la era de la tecnología produjese la mayor desigualdad del mundo. Entonces, algo hemos hecho mal. Y por tanto eso lo, lo tenemos que tener en cuenta, porque vamos a seguir viviendo en un mundo globalizado y en un mundo tecnológico. Entonces, o abordamos ese problema desde el punto de vista del multilateralismo, desde el punto de vista de la globalización, o no vamos a poder avanzar. Porque si no, es verdad que cada uno estará haciendo lo que pueda, Senegal, Mali. Yo trabajo en Senegal, y trabajo en Mali, trabajo con mujeres, por cierto, que además les recomendaría a todos que si quieren saber los problemas que tiene la inmigración, hablen con las mujeres. Porque fundamentalmente las inmigrantes son mujeres, muchas mujeres y muchos jóvenes. ¿Por qué inmigran además las mujeres? Pues porque no tienen mmm, 
capacidad para dar una vida digna ni a ellas mismas ni a sus hijos. Porque todo se arreglaría si garantizásemos desde la globalización una vida digna de ser vivida a cada ser humano. Lo digo así, de, es así de sencillo y así de difícil, pero como el modelo, el modelo en el que estamos instalados es un modelo neoliberal salvaje, pues ha producido esa desigualdad. Y lo que se hizo después de la Segunda Guerra Mundial, que es el pacto entre el capital y el trabajo, se rompió. Se ha roto, hay que volver a hacerlo. Pero lo tenemos que hacer también desde lo internacional, desde lo local y desde lo global. Desde lo local y desde lo global. En una cooperación de lo local y lo global. El pacto que los jefes de Estado han suscrito hace una semana está muy bien. Pero hay que decir que es menos ambicioso que el anterior. O sea, que estamos peor. Bueno, hay mucha voluntad de arreglarlo, pero se ha quedado en unas declaraciones que ahora veremos cómo se traducen en la realidad concreta. Y a mí me gusta mucho ver participar a líderes europeos muy importantes en, en, en ese pacto que han venido aquí, y por lo tanto lo aplaudo, pero también esos líderes europeos, Europa tiene que cambiar sus políticas de cooperación con África. Cambiarlas, cambiarlas, porque lo que no puede ser es lo que está siendo. ¿Eh? Es decir, que sale más de África que entra. Después, si hacemos el saldo de la cuenta de lo que sale de África a través de quienes tienen las explotaciones de todas las grandes riquezas y compañías que se producen en África, son muchos europeos. Países todavía antiguos colonizadores. No voy a, pero es que es así. O sea, es que están las empresas, eh, las grandes compañías están allí. Lo que sale en forma de beneficios y de muchas vías es mucho más de lo que entra en vía de por la vía de acuerdos de cooperación, de ayuda humanitaria, es inferior. Y eso no puede ser. Hay que establecer una cooperación humana, igualitaria y digna, no indecente. Lo digo así, es así de duro, pero es que o vamos de verdad a decir las cosas como son, o no vamos a avanzar nada más que de cara a mostrar a nuestra ciudadanía que tenemos voluntad pero que todo es muy difícil. No, no es difícil. Es que no es difícil arreglar este problema. Me niego a decir que es difícil. Es facilísimo, es querer. Queremos. Vamos a ver si queremos. Pero hay que cambiar las cosas que se dicen, decir las cosas que no se hacen y hacer las cosas que hay que hacer para que cambie el problema, para que la gente tenga derecho a una vida digna, a vivir. Porque la gente emigra por muchas razones. Muchas veces se emigra también por razones no solo de, de, de seguridad o no solo de pobreza, también para mejorar su situación. Y yo puedo hablar de una migración, yo creo, maravillosa que hay con África. Yo les preguntaría a ustedes, ¿ustedes saben, por ejemplo, cuántas científicas africanas hay en África? Mujeres, ¿eh? Científicas senior que están haciendo másters y custos y becas sabáticas en Europa, traídas por algunas organizaciones, entre ellas la mía, un montón, un montón, esa es la cooperación que hay que hacer, porque vuelven, además las mujeres siempre que salen vuelven, no robamos talentos, porque las mujeres vuelven cuando hay una inmigración, porque tienen muchos intereses en su, de dónde se han ido, que son sus familias y son sus países, y esa es la realidad, y esa es lo que hay que hacer, esa es la cooperación que hay que hacer, la cooperación para formar, para la educación, para la inversión, inversión en capital humano, Inversión en liderazgo político, científico, técnico, para que tengan oportunidades para dárselas a sus hijos. Y yo les aseguro que las mujeres vuelven. Todas las que vienen, en, en la organización que yo uh, promuevo, hacen además el discurso ya de entrada. No me pregunten si voy a volver. ¿Cómo no voy a volver? Claro que voy a volver. Tengo mi país, tengo mi tierra, tengo mis hijos, tengo mis intereses y tengo mi equipo científico al que tengo que volver. Eso es lo que hay que promover. Y ahí es donde hay que meter los recursos de la cooperación ahí y en la ayuda humanitaria por supuesto pero también ahí y ahí se pone muy poco a mí me cuesta mucho trabajo motivar a las grandes compañías para que inviertan bien en África eso es lo que es invertir bien en África eso es lo que es invertir y no decir por ejemplo como ha hecho la Unión Europea que en Mali por cierto uno de los primeros acuerdos de la mesa de Argel fue abrir las escuelas del norte porque abrir las escuelas del norte que están cerradas porque no hay profesores 
forma parte de la seguridad. Ya ha habido proyectos presentados en la Unión Europea para abrir las escuelas del norte. ¿Y qué ha dicho la Unión Europea? Quien gestiona la cooperación, que la educación no es la seguridad. Y se han rechazado esos proyectos. Y las escuelas del norte siguen sin abrirse. Ahí hay que invertir. Y eso hay que denunciarlo. En la Unión Europea y en todos sitios. Porque todos hacemos cosas mal. Todos hacemos cosas bien, pero todos hacemos también cosas mal. Y por tanto yo creo que hay que levantar el velo de la hipocresía y decir la verdad de lo que está pasando y de lo que está ocurriendo. Y pregunten ustedes yo. a las mujeres, a las africanas, pregúntenles. Que ya verán cómo se van a enterar perfectamente bien sin hacer ningún, ningún, eh, ninguna encuesta. ¿Mm? que cojan a una de cada país, se van a enterar de lo que está pasando. Hmm. María Teresa, since you're on a very truthful search and uh, provocative mission, let me ask you this. What's the difference between human trafficking today and slavery 300 years ago? What is the difference? One was formal, the other was what? Pues a mí, a mí me parece que el tráfico de seres humanos es eh, una de las lacras más terribles que se producen en, el, en el, lo que es el espacio de la inmigración irregular. Eh, y que además tiene muchas caras horrorosas. Y la peor es... Es decir, porque es, todo empieza en la inmigración irregular, acaba siendo seres humanos traficados porque es un negocio y sobre todo mujeres también, entra la prostitución, entra la droga y entra la trata. Y, el, y, el, y, el, y además el circuito es ese, inmigración irregular, desigualdad, pobreza, miseria, tráfico, prostitución... Droga, esclavitud sexual y trata. Mm. Terrible. Y nadie le gusta hablar de, de la trata ni del tráfico. A las organizaciones internacionales yeah. de los derechos humanos no les gusta porque es la cara más oscura, right. más tenebrosa, más day, terrible y más indecente. María Teresa, de 3.000 a 5.000 millones ¿eh? one man's de misery, beneficios. One man's misery is another man's opportunity. Efectivamente. Questions from the floor, please. All right, let's start with that gentleman over there, and then we'll go to you, young lady over there. Who, yeah, real quick. Okay, tell I, us who you are, who you represent. Uh, Rich, Richard Danziger from the International Organization for Migration and the Regional Director for West Africa. Under uh, the sort of slavery that occurred in the Americas in the 19th century, the rate of return on your investment, and like I say, I hate to talk about a human being like a commodity, was about 8% a year. And it was in your interest to at least take minimal care of what you invested in Uh, to get as much productivity out of that person, man or woman or child, for as long as possible. In modern day slavery, you don't buy the person, or sometimes you do, but the cost is minimal, the rate of return is uh, almost infinite, and you can throw away that person afterwards. Uh, it's what we call disposable people, because you have no interest in even keeping that person alive. You want to just work them to death and, until the end. So in many so, ways... What do you mean by infinite? Well, you just keep making profit until that person reselling is, is and reselling. Dead. Yeah, or, or is dead. Or is, I mean, it happens to women who are just kept, you know, constantly yeah. raped and raped yeah, yeah. and raped until um, and that's it. Goodness. Like I say, I hate to talk so unemotionally about it, sure, but this no, no. is what happens in the worst cases. Wow. Wow. Thank you for that, Richard. Yes, ma'am. Two points. I'm Your name first. Elena Paneritis. I'm an institutional economist. Greek, American, occasionally. So, uh, one point, you're very important. What's the difference between slavery and trafficking? Modern day trafficking. Okay? So slavery was the way of doing business. It was an accepted mode of economic development at the time. It was the way people used labor, and it was open, transparent, there was a slavery market, you would go out there, check the people, buy them, whatever. Now, trade, Trading, trafficking, is done in the cachet, completely under the table. There is absolutely no remorse. There is no uh, uh, policing for it. And it looks like there are basically two markets, and what I call the formal and the informal market. And as long as the informal market is feeding the <coughs> formal market, no one is going to look after tra trafficking. So, so I live in Greece, and one 
overnight, one day, outside of my house, I had 8,000 people squatting the old, the old uh, airport. Did Syrian um, uh, war occur that night before? No, it was happening long ago, several years ago, but traffickers decided to push them over that, over that, that month. The second thing I wanted to mention is, we are all talking about, cry we're crying over spilled milk. We're talking about after the fact. No one is really sitting down to figure out what should we do to keep these people where they are. How can we make them have a stake in their own countries? How can they make them have something to fight for themselves, their identity cards, their wealth, their home? Why no one is talking about establishing security of property rights in their own home? Over 70% of the globe is informal. That means that the 30% of the globe that is formal is in extinction. It's only a theory of numbers. The 30 is smaller than 70. And we've blamed globalization for that? No. Globalization has just made it easier and more, more obvious for us, the 30%, to see what's happening over there. And we still don't do anything about it. Yeah. So that was my Two point. good points. I don't, know, I don't know if I agree with you about that um, accepted, acceptable business 300 years ago, slavery. Well, it was, it accepted was by being, whom? Yeah. Well, it was a way of, I mean, it wasn't done, it was, you know, you had books, you had bookkeeping of, of uh, the... Yeah, but that doesn't mean it was accepted. It was... Just... Accepted in, in a very, in the same way it was discussed with my previous uh, commenter. Accepted in the sense that you had plantations, we, had, we didn't have industrialization yet. All right, that, that's a topic for another day, but yeah, okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, bonjour. Bonjour. Moi, je suis, je, je suis agricultrice. Je viens du Sénégal. Et je voudrais partager une expérience pour mes gens qui, qui sont de l'Afrique de l'Ouest, du Mali et du Sénégal, par rapport à la dame qui vient d'Espagne, ce qu'il vient de dire. C'est une réalité. Moi, j'ai fait mes études au Canada en formation en gestion et exploitation d'entreprises agricoles. Et quand j'ai terminé mes études, je suis rentrée reprendre la ferme familiale de mon père. Et quand je suis arrivée, j'ai remarqué une chose qu'au Sénégal, qu'on avait deux problèmes. On avait une population qui était jeune, mais qui n'avait pas une formation. Beaucoup immigraient. Alors j'ai dit, pourquoi aujourd'hui l'expérience canadienne que j'ai eue, de le ramener au Sénégal Alors j'ai parlé à des agriculteurs qui étaient dans la région de Sandjara. Je leur ai parlé euh, de mon activité pour qu'on puisse travailler ensemble. On a posé un projet dans le but de maintenir les jeunes dans le village parce que beaucoup pensaient à émigrer. Alors, donc, quand j'ai amené le projet, au début, ils étaient un peu sceptiques parce qu'ils ne comprenaient pas, parce que je venais avec un concept qui était typiquement canadien. Je leur ai expliqué, ça a pris des mois et des mois, mais finalement, ça a marché. Aujourd'hui, je travaille avec des, villes, avec des agriculteurs qui sont à Sanjara. Ils m'ont donné 96 hectares. Aujourd'hui, je leur donne leur, une formation et leurs enfants travaillent là-bas, une formation gratuite. En même temps, ils deviennent des employés. Ça veut dire aujourd'hui, dans cette zone, on a pu maintenir 300 personnes à Sanjara. D'autres qui pensaient aller à l'étranger, ils ne pensent même plus. Et avec cet argent qu'ils gagnent, ils sont parvenus à créer d'autres économies dans, dans le village où ils sont. Ils sont allés vers d'autres secteurs, le poulailler, l'aviculture, la charcuterie, autre chose. Et je pense que ce serait bien que dans nos États en Afrique de l'Ouest, si c'est possible de reproduire le même système. Parce qu'il faut expliquer aux jeunes d'abord, c'est quoi l'agriculture. Et je pense aujourd'hui en Afrique, surtout en Afrique de l'Ouest, il faut qu'on pousse les jeunes à aller dans l'agriculture. Okay. Parce que c'est le seul métier où on peut vraiment engager beaucoup plus de personnes et aussi de la volonté politique. D'accord, ok. We understand that. Um, Monsieur Diop, hold that answer for a moment, ok? Because we have quite a few. Okay. We were asking questions. Please keep them short, ok? There's quite a few hands up. We'll go to you, lady, young lady, first. You go first. But let's keep it short so that we can get all the answers before we wrap up for lunch. Go ahead. Sí, mi nombre es Laura Albornoz. Soy, fui la primera ministra de la mujer del gobierno de Bachelet en Chile. 
Um, y la verdad que me sorprende mucho que cuando, y, y coincido absolutamente con María Teresa, se reflexiona respecto de la migración, no es posible ver efectivamente el impacto que tiene tremendamente diferenciado mujeres y jóvenes, niños. Um, creo que hemos sido muy mezquinos a la hora de analizar efectivamente el modelo y ver cómo este se convierte en un modelo sangriento para... Eh, quienes más sufren, quienes son los más vulnerables. Entonces mi pregunta tiene que ver particularmente con el foco de la atención y el foco del discurso que nosotros vamos creando respecto del impacto migratorio, cómo afecta diferenciadamente y de manera mucho más rotunda a las mujeres y a los hombres, algo han hablado los panelistas, eh, a las mujeres y a los jóvenes, digo. Pero me parece que de todas maneras, y lo digo con mucha vergüenza, porque Chile recientemente no suscribió el pacto migratorio, eh, lo digo con vergüenza también porque los nacionalismos en América Latina se han reinstalado con mucha fuerza. Entonces, en ese marco global, como efectivamente tenemos un discurso que permee eh, y nos permita focalizarnos en aquellos aspectos realmente relevantes. Ok. Which part of keep it short did we not understand? Real quick. And then we'll go to that side. Don't worry, guys. I haven't forgotten you. You had your hand up first. Short. Thank you very much. Can you remember all that? Uh, my name is Mohamed Dasha. I'm a development economist, but also I volunteer in refugee rescue and relief missions. So when you're talking about the human cost of migration, I know what it is because I fished bodies out of the Mediterranean. See that photo over there? Yeah. That, that many people die every day in the Mediterranean in 2018. What are we talking a day? What's the number? We're talking 15, between 15 and 20 daily in 2018 on average. Inside the Mediterranean Sea? On the Mediterranean Sea, which is the most dangerous uh, route for migrants today. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. So the panel, with the exception of Ms. Fernandez de la Vega, has been about long term and how do we keep people from migrating and finding excuses and looking for data. We have a lot of data. We also have a I'm crisis sure, at hand sure. today. Yeah. Um, most of the migration is from south to south. So that's, that's important to notice. It's not just north to, uh, south to north. So when we look at solution, that's one. The second thing is one of the questions on the brief for this panel is what's the role for NGOs? The role for NGOs is immense because governments are not stepping up. It's because why people like me, who are not rescue people, have to go. Médecins Sans Frontières, which is one of the most respected organizations in the world, has had to seize their rescue um, missions in the Mediterranean last week because the Italian government is not allowing their boats to take off and to land. So I would like us to think, one, the short term, we're talking about fixing the, the infrastructure, but let's talk about the leaks, because these leaks have names and families and they die. And two, let us think about whose responsibility is it that we're failing at tackling the refugee crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Mohamed. Good point. Okay. This side, where's the microphone? You, sir, you stood up. Keep it short, keep it short. Uh, bonjour, je m'appelle Mounaim Lamrani, je suis journaliste, j'ai travaillé un petit peu sur les histoires d'immigration. Uh, J'aimerais... Uh, signaler une chose concernant le flux de, de, qui a été dit de, lors de, de l'adoption du pacte sur la masse d'argent qui part. Alors les immigrés, il paraît que les immigrés qui, sont, qui se trouvent dans les pays développés euh, 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 dépensent 95% de leurs revenus dans les pays de résidence. Il y a seulement 5% qui vient, qu'ils envoient vers leur famille. Et ces 5% euh, sont beaucoup plus que toute l'aide au développement fournie par les pays du Nord. Ça, c'est le premier point. Le deuxième point, là, j'aimerais une réaction de la part de, éventuellement de Madame Bousta et de Madame Teresa de la Vega. Euh, au Maroc, euh, le, le, le point le plus près de l'Europe, entre guillemets, c'est Ceuta et Melilla, ce n'est pas le détroit de Gibraltar. Il euh, y a une frontière terrestre. Et dans ces deux villes que, que, que l'Espagne considère comme espagnoles, que nous, les Marocains considèrent comme occupées, il y a ce qu'on appelle les CETI, les centres de transit temporaire qui sont surchargés. Et j'ai parlé, quelqu'un a dit qu'il faut parler à les immigrés. J'ai parlé avec les, les immigrants subsahariens là-bas. Ils m'ont dit, tant qu'il y a le CETI à Ceuta, eh ben on, on, on viendra, on sautera la barrière. La barrière qui est pour le moment euh, de, de fil de fer barbelé et qu'un parti, un nouveau parti qui vient de... Euh, qui, est, qui monte en Espagne veut construire un mur. Donc euh, voilà, merci. OK. Anyone else from this idea, yeah, sir? Sorry, my name is Baba Garba from Nigeria. In fact, Nigerian ambassador to Morocco. I find it, uh, Jeff, I find it very, very troubling listening to the definition given to say slavery. And uh, I'm glad that you made an intervention. I can only say that definition is halfway, in fact, one quarter way of actual definition of slavery. And I sincerely wish to refer the person to go and read much about slavery 
it's very troubled. Yeah. Having said that, uh, we didn't have the occasion of, you know, having the privilege, I think my minister is here, the foreign minister, to make comment on the first session. The first session, I think I concur to the minister's uh, statement that regional integration is the way forward. He talked about leadership. Yeah. We can have, we have certain uh, regional uh, organization that were not successful, but we have some that were successful. Here I'm referring to the ECOWAS sub-region. ECOWAS is a clear-cut case of successful regional integration. Perfect, I cannot say, but good and very good, I can say. And okay. the success story can be seen on the entrenchment of democracy in the sub-region. Mr. Ambassador, can I play devil's advocate real quick for a moment? I don't know yeah. if your foreign minister is still here, but let me ask you real quick. Go ahead. Why are Nigerians still leaving their country? So many reasons. No, just Niger give me three. Simple reason is that Nigeria is country of origin, transit camp, at the same time, destination country. So giving you all this will give you the simple scenario of what is happening. And yet the country is so rich in natural resources, rich in just about everything, but Nigerians are still seeking greener pastures. Migration is a continuous process. You can't stop people from moving where they want right. to do. And Good that point. is the freedom Thank you, of sir. everybody having that. Good Thank point. you. Thank you. Sir. <coughs> Jawad Kardouti, Institut Marocain des Relations Internationales. Alors, les panélistes ont beaucoup parlé des causes, des financements, également des actions dans les pays d'origine, mais ils n'ont pas beaucoup parlé de ce qu'on peut faire dans les pays d'accueil. Et je pense que c'est important aussi. Dans le cas du Maroc, ce n'est pas parce que je suis marocain que je parle du Maroc, mais quand même, le Maroc a quand même régularisé 50 000 migrants. Et je pense que tous les pays d'accueil devrait faire un effort pour régulariser. Parce qu'un un migrant qui n'est pas régularisé, eh ben, il est dans la rue, il ne peut pas chercher un travail, il peut même commettre des délits. Donc c'est très important la régularisation, la formation aussi, et euh, également aider au recrutement. Je pense qu'il faut beaucoup insister sur ce que peuvent faire les pays d'accueil. Merci. OK. There's lots of questions, lots of comments. OK. I think your boss wants to say something. Is that okay? Yes, No, thank you. Uh, thank you. I completely share what she has said brightly on Moroccan policy on fast migration. Voy a hablar contigo, María Teresa. ¿Te acuerdas en 2008, España y Marruecos, hemos transformado una crisis humanitaria en un modelo de cooperación inédito en el Mediterráneo, con la conferencia de Rabat? Yo me pregunto hoy, y estoy de acuerdo contigo, que tenemos un problema con la Unión Europea, lo has dicho muy bien. Hay una falta de amb ambición. La cuestión de la migración es una cuestión de responsabilidad compartida. Y siempre cuando negociamos con la Unión Europea, nos ponen la cuestión de los acuerdos de readmisión, readmission agreements. Yo entiendo, como di 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 dijeron nuestros amigos, que tenemos que hacer nuestro trabajo interno a nivel de los países africanos. Y lo que estamos haciendo, y como dijo la señora Buceta, líder de su majestad, el rey, en tema de la migración africana. Pero, ¿qué podemos hacer con Europa para que cambien el enfoque? Y el enfoque hasta una responsabilidad compartida, pero también con respeto de la dimensión humana. Eso es importante, and I finished. All right, I know this topic is not going to go away. Thank you, merci, merci beaucoup. It's not going to go away anytime soon, but we are out of time right now. We have to go to lunch first, and then you can continue. At lunchtime, you can go one-on-one -on -one with these folks. In the meantime, I'm going to give each of you two minutes, two minutes to conclude. Ladies first. Maria Teresa, you go first. You can incorporate what was asked or what was told to you and give us your conclusion as well. Don't forget that lady over there in the corner. But give us your conclusions. You've got two minutes each. Bueno, yo creo que la verdad es que el debate es súper interesantísimo porque todo el mundo tiene cosas que aportar y además cosas que aportar en positivo. Yo creo que aquí se ha hablado de regularización, se ha hablado de acuerdo entre España y Marruecos. Es decir, eso pone de manifiesto lo que yo decía. El tema tiene solución. Es un problema de querer tener y poner el foco y la voluntad y la acción política donde se debe, que es descriminalizar la inmigración ya de una vez por todas y atender a la inmigración 
con sus causas verdaderas, atajando esas causas, invirtiendo en origen, eh, invirtiendo en educación, invirtiendo en agricultura, por aquí se ha dicho, en, en África, en formación, en el origen, en los países de origen. Eso es para evitar que la gente salga y se quede. Pero al mismo tiempo hay que también dar la oportunidad que al que salga se forme y vuelva. Acuerdos de readmisión, acuerdos de, de, de tener otra mirada distinta sobre este fenómeno. Y yo creo que además, sinceramente, eh, España y Marruecos, Marruecos y España, estamos llamados por nuestra posición geoestratégica a ser los que hagamos de intermediación entre África y, de alguna manera, y Europa porque somos la frontera y, y, y entendemos mejor, o podemos, deberíamos entender mejor y, ten, y poner toda nuestra capacidad para tratar de promover eh, un, un espacio, que es un espacio natural, que es África y Europa, que nos vamos a necesitar, además, porque en Europa se ponen a mayores con la inmigración, pero la espada de, Demo, de Democracia es la, la espada demográfica, y, y claro, la demografía en Europa está así y en África está así. Luego nos vamos a necesitar y más vale que nos empecemos a necesitar ya desde ahora ayudándonos en una cooperación igualitaria, decente, que cree riqueza, porque a su vez la inmigración crea riqueza. En España, en el momento en que la economía ha crecido más, es cuando hicimos regularizaciones de inmigrantes, cuando estábamos en el gobierno. Yo estuve en el gobierno del presidente Zapatero y ahí hicimos varias regularizaciones y tuvimos el mejor momento económico, porque se creó empleo, porque se crea integración, porque se crean derechos, porque se evita la violencia, porque, porque se evita la catástrofe que supone todo esto que está ocurriendo. All right. Merci. Gracias. Gracias. Monia Busta. Merci. Je vais revenir. C'est très difficile de réagir à toutes les, les questions. Mais ce qui semble important, c'est qu'on a besoin de tous les acteurs. Effectivement, la société civile joue un rôle très important, mais également les politiques, parce que ça permet de mettre le cadre légal et législatif qui permet de protéger et de préserver les droits des migrants. Maintenant, euh, quelle est la meilleure approche le, On a parlé du, du compact global. Oui, c'est une réponse internationale, c'est une mobilisation internationale, mais ce n'est pas une solution. Bien sûr, le défi, c'est de le pouvoir l'implémenter et mettre des projets concrets. Et donc, ça revient à la question principale que cette question de migration, que le veuille ou non, quels que soient les engagements qu'on peut prendre au niveau politique, si ce n'est pas traduit par des projets concrets sur le terrain, ça n'aura aucun impact. Et s'il y a une action de coopération à développer à l'échelle internationale ou régionale, elle doit se traduire par des projets concrets. Et si je devais mettre une priorité, je mettrais l'éducation en priorité, je mettrais le renforcement des capacités et je mettrais tout ce qui est création d'environnements favorables à l'innovation, à la prise d'initiative, avec bien évidemment tout ce qui peut favoriser l'émergence d'une réelle économie, d'une réelle valeur ajoutée. Ne se va pas uniquement venir par, euh, je dirais, une approche où les pays du Nord vont nous donner, on attend une aide des pays du Nord pour qu'ils nous donnent des programmes de développement, on attend ce qu'ils vont nous proposer. Je pense que les pays, les pays du Sud, les pays qui sont origines de migration doivent également travailler sur les modèles qui permettraient de créer ces opportunités, qui, qui doivent être à même d'interroger, d'interpeller sur les meilleures conditions pour pouvoir créer ces opportunités, ces emplois. Merci beaucoup, Excellence. Euh, Abdullah Koulibaly. Merci. Je pense que, parlant de la problématique de la migration, nous devons d'abord mettre l'accent sur la gouvernance mondiale. Euh, parce que tant que le monde même n'est pas bien coordonné, le désordre va persister. Nos destins sont liés, donc il nous faut travailler à construire beaucoup plus des ponts que des murs. L'Afrique change. L'Afrique est riche. Ce changement de l'Afrique va continuer. Et moi, je suis sûr, sachant que la richesse est dans le métissage, la richesse étant dans la diversité, demain, on va prendre date, on va changer le flux migratoire. Bientôt, en Afrique, on va accueillir beaucoup de migrants venant de l'Europe. Voilà, ça, c'est mon mot de la fin. Merci beaucoup. Uh, Biram Diop, I'll save you for last. Lloyd, Axworthy, you got your two minutes. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, here's my... Um observation. I think it's about time you stop thinking all, only about Europe. Uh, Europe's got big problems. Uh, its bigger countries are collapsing. Germany, France, Britain. So the, uh, the leadership is going to come 
from different sources. And I know it's hard to change old habits when you've been sort of dealing uh, for a long period with old colonial powers, but they simply don't have the clout anymore. Let me give you an, a, an obverse example. At the G8 three months ago, through a coalition of smaller countries, we were able to put together a $4 billion fund for women and children's education. That didn't come from any great power. It didn't come from any large significant. And I think that there was actually some participation of African countries. So you've got to kind of, if you're going to deal with these problems, you have to reset your lens a little bit. Thirdly, I think you're right. You do need a work plan. And I think that's what our council has been working on. We're not interested in the, the grand design. But let me give you the question about uh, trafficking versus slavery. In the boat people issue, people didn't go on private boats or pirate ships. Every single uh, resettlement that we took into Canada, and there were 70,000 of them, we hired commercial aircraft to take them there. So they were totally safe and arrived. IMO was actually a major player in organizing those kinds of things. So that, is it more expensive? Sure. But it saved the, the question of who's doing it. And that's where I think where, where the failure is, is that we've lost that uh, collective, collaborative capacity to bring sort of countries from different regions in who have real commitments and begin to work together uh, to begin uh, honing down on some very specific issues. As I said, I, I would be thrilled if uh, some of the foreign ministers or leaders in this room said, hey, we're prepared to sit down and talk to you. How do we recover $80 billion that's been stolen from our people in Africa and restore it so that it becomes directly available for humanitarian refugee development purposes? That's something you're going to have to do here. I mean, my guys can find the forensic evidence to show you where it is. We can go to the, our courts and open up but we have no idea where it should go. Lloyd. And that's where the part, yeah. part is. So yeah. my, my point is, you know, you've got to start having a different deck of cards. Right, but you know, $80 billion, will that prevent 15, 20 people a day being fish food in the Mediterranean? $80 billion would be uh, so far superior to what's coming in now when $8 billion is the total budget for UNHCR, and they're trying to scrape a couple of hundred of that to convert it into development purposes. But I'm Dio, you get the final word. Actually, I have nothing to say. Everything has been said. <laughs> All my go. points, no, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> All my points were already <laughs> made. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. More yeah. seriously, I would like to emphasize the fact that migration itself is not bad. Oh. It's rather a very good thing. Together, we are always stronger. What is bad? is unsafe and unmanaged migration. So that's what we should be fighting for, against, I'm sorry. Mm. Now, fighting unsafe and unmanaged uh, 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 migration requires medium terms, long terms, and short terms, my brother. We need to be working concomitantly on the short term solutions, which is fighting against all the bad activities that are taking place to protect lives. But in the meantime, we need to project ourselves in the future. So it's really working on these two dimensions of, of, the, of the problem. And I could not agree more with my, uh, my mother from Senegal, Aminata, because she has the same name as my mother. We can keep people where they are. And we're trying to do so in Senegal. We have one new program we are very proud of. This program consists of building in localities where the migrants are generally originated from. Traditional cultural huts to promote citizenship and good neighborhood because the huts are right at the boundary between Senegalese populations and our neighbors' populations. So with one stone, we kill two birds. 
with this heart, we have the local approach, but also we have the transnational approach, the regional approach. And we empower the local populations so that they can themselves identify the reasons why they consider their people, particularly the youngsters, are leaving. And the same populations will work together and see what they can do concretely to keep the youngsters where they are. And this program has women and youth at the heart of it. And I can discuss it with uh, uh, people during the, during the, during the break yeah. or later on. But local solutions, in my opinion, can give very good result in the fight we are all undertaking to contain and manage and, and save migration. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Biram Diop, Lloyd Axworthy, Munia Busta, Abdullah Kulabila, and Maria Teresa Fernandez de la Vega. Thank you so much. Gracias. Uh, merci beaucoup. A round of applause for my panelists, please. Yeah. And like Biram said, like Mr. Diop said, confront them during lunch. Talk to them. You can, and lunch is served at Pavilion de la Piscine. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Bon appétit, tout le monde. You know, group shot. They want a photo. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. We will now break for lunch and reconvene at 2 o'clock. Lunch will be served okay, the boss comes back down. and at the French <laughs> restaurant. We will reconvene at 2 o'clock. Please follow staff directions and have a good meal.